Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and for your blessings over us. Thank you that you are able to bring hope even through the toughest times, strengthening us for your purpose. Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that you are always with us and never leave us. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice so that we might have freedom and life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are and all that you do and for all that you've given us. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh. Renew our spirit. 
Fill us with your peace and joy. We love you and need you this day and every day. We give you praise and thanks for you alone are worthy. And now will you please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. And um, uh, before I get started today, I wanted to bring your attention to the bulletin, which you should have received on your way inside. On it, you have both a connect card and a prayer card. They're both directly on the back of each other. If you're joining us for the first time today, um, welcome. First of all, uh, I would ask that you fill out that connect card. Let us know you're here. And we'd love to get you connected to the church. Also, I, uh, yes, the prayer card. Let's get to that. <laughs> um, I'd encourage you to fill out the prayer card as well um, so that we know how to pray for you during the week. Um, you can take both the prayer card and connect card um, along with any tithes and offerings. Bring them to the foyer and drop them off in the boxes just outside the sanctuary. And with that, uh, I'd love to have Pastor Steve lead us in a message. Thank you. Oh, my gosh, I love that music. Thank you. Well, uh, you're made in the image of God. That's the good news. Um, and I won't even talk about the bad news. But the good news is you're made in the image of God. We want to talk about that today. Uh, what does that mean, actually, to be made in the image of God? Uh, we talked a bit about that last week. Uh, you know, what, what image are you embracing uh, whose image, what image are you embracing uh, as the guide for your own identity and direction in life? We want to dial it in and talk specifically about this question. What does it mean to, to be made uh, in the image of God? Is it just figurative, literary, hyperbolic, poetic language? Uh, or, or is it telling us something that is so core to who we are, to who God is and who we are, that if we miss it, we miss the whole message? Uh, so that's where we're going today. And to, to give us a framework, let's start with Genesis, uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. If you're new to reading the Bible, uh, it's confusing, all these names. Uh, you think, oh, Genesis, yeah, I drive one. No, it's not a car brand, it's, it's the first book of the Bible, and there's a lot of books in the Bible. The names usually have something to do with the first word in the text, or, or the best description of it, or by whom it's written. Uh, and then it's numbered uh, because it was a simple way to help people find their way through it. So if you're new to reading the Bible, uh, that's what's going on. There's a name, and the, the, the chapters and verses are numbered. None of this was written with numbers attached to it. The only, the only books that had numbers attached to it, uh, uh, the only things written were the Psalms, 150 of those, and then the Proverbs, there's 30 of those. So here we are, the first, first book of the Bible, Genesis, in the beginning. Uh, that's the first word, better sheet, in the beginning. Uh, uh, and so then God said, verse 26, let us make humankind, mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then this is further developed. And then there's laws and guidelines given about how we should treat creation. So let's just pause on this for a moment. So God says, Let us make uh, mankind in our image and our likeness. Two different words, meaning, the, meaning um, kind of the, the whole picture. To be made in the image of God is to, to be like what God is. 
to, to be made in His likeness is to do what God does. So it's really a being and a doing. One word is emphasizing the being, and the other word is emphasizing the doing. Uh, and so let's make mankind in our image, uh, our image and in our likeness, so that in this being and in this doing, he says, they may rule. Now that is a very inviting thing. I find that very attractive. The idea that I get to rule something. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a moment. And, and the idea is he's giving uh, us cumulatively responsibility. And so he's, he re, it's repeated in, the, in, the, in verse 27. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. So there's no second class citizens. It's one humanity, male and female. Uh, male and female. And, and over the, the course of the church's life there's been confusion at times and, and uh, conflict at times over the status of being a male or being a female. Uh, and this carried into the New Testament. And to this day, uh, there's all kinds of interesting conversations about what it means and, and, the, and the status and the, um, the distinction of being a male or a female. And we're, we're all over the map on it as, as, as people to, to show you the, the confusion uh, that reigns in the world that we live in. Because God made us in His image, in His likeness, to be and do what He does. Uh, and, and, and He gives us this really incredibly high and holy assignment that, is, that really ends up becoming the, the purpose for which we live and the source of everything that's meaningful and significant in our life. And this is chapter 1. Chapter 2 uh, restates the creation narrative and then in chapter 3 it, it all goes south. I mean literally you could say it all goes to hell because it, 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 it's where we disobey God and we're kicked out of the garden. And, and now we're cursed and it's horrible. And everything is a devolution of despair and disaster. Uh, and so um, wow, it started so great. And these words subdue and rule. Uh, on this side of the fall, those sound like super harsh and negative words. Ooh, subdue, rule. If I stood up at a wedding and said, hey, we're here, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, this groom is going to rule over this bride. Uh, you know, uh, everybody would be super nervous and uptight and the, the, the groom would be nervous because he has to face the bride later. And when she says, and what do you think that means? You know, um, and so to subdue, I mean, that's something you do in MMA. You know, in mi mixed martial arts, the idea is, is to subdue. And you know, the tap out. That's what it means to be subdued. You tap out or to break something off your, off your body. Uh, and so these are negative words in the connotation of a fallen world. But on the other side, on the original, in the original context, this idea of ruling over, subduing, was, bringing, was building uh, on the momentum of God's creative order. God creates this magnificently amazing and beautiful creation. Every part of it, he says, is good, and the ultimate uh, description of good is doubled. Good, good. Uh, tov, tov, in Hebrew, it's very good. That's when he created us. So all of it's good. And so to subdue and rule is to carry forward this incredibly beautiful creation. Of course, that's not our experience of it. To subdue is to rape and pillage the land. You know, If, if you've ever been in, flying over Canada, if you're in a boat or a car, can, Canada is gorgeous. As soon as you get in a plane or on a peak, it's nothing but bare hillsides right behind the, the, you know, the front range is all forest, and behind that it's just scarred of you know, lumber. Uh, if you've ever been to big mining operations, it's just horrific. You know? um, uh, Butte, Montana probably started out being called Beautiful Montana until they did the mining. Then they said, let's, just, let's cut that off. It's just Butte. It's not even beautiful anymore. And so you see how, what we've done to the world. Many, many beautiful places, but there are lots of other crazily ugly places. There is a permanent thing called the, the, um, uh, the gyre. Now, if you've ever sailed out in the ocean, far out in the ocean, you'll see uh, collections of debris. But there's a central place where the oceans meet in the world that's a perpetual dump, and it's called the gyre. Uh, and a gyre is something that catches debris in a river. And so they've applied that term to this part of the ocean where it's miles upon miles of junk. It floats there. Uh, but if you go talk to the people of Birch or Scripps, they'll tell you that all that stuff eventually uh, falls apart into microscopic particles. And that they're, they're, doing, they're, they're finding that fish around the world all have these little tiny microplastic particles in them. 
So this is the destruction that we've, we've you know, done to the earth. And in a, even in our best intentions, we've done things that, uh, while it helps on one hand, it, it scars the planet on the other. So my point being that this idea of subdue and rule, uh, it, it makes everybody nervous. If you got a postcard and said, hey, uh, this development company is inviting you to a community meeting because they're going to be doing some subduing and ruling in your neighborhood, and like, they like your input on it. And you're thinking, oh no, what are they going to do? You know, uh, We found a wonderful energy generating uh, process. It'll, it'll pay all your property taxes. In fact, we won't even be charging you for anything anymore. And it's just called a toxic waste dump. It's going to be so good because all this debris from the nuclear, you, know, you can create the scenarios. So this is what goes on in a world that's fallen. Every good thing that God gave us as part of being created in his image culminating in our, our commissioning, our job to rule it all, is compromised uh, because of the, of the fallen nature of this world. So what do you do then? If the image of God is a beautiful, wonderful thing, but it's so easily corrupted uh, into interpersonal conflict uh, or environmental conflict, sociopolitical, et cetera, economic conflict, what do you do? We're going to talk about that. So three points. Uh, the first one being this, that God blessed us with qualities and capacities for a particular purpose in bearing his image. God created us with qualities and capacities, capacities for a particular purpose in bearing his image. That's what we tend to think of as the meaning of bearing his image. Well, I can think, I can imagine, uh, I can ideate, I can, I can create, I have a sense of consciousness, uh, I, can, I can do all these wonderful things. Well, of course, immediately what any number of scientists will tell you is, well, we can show you that all that's true of many other creatures as well, to some degree, not, a, not, not to the degree in the human being. Also, and the whole idea is it kind of is taking us down a notch. And this is, this is very much a, 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 I won't say that it's a scientific approach at all. It's, 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 it's ascientific, that is, it's not scientific, because what it is is a philosophy saying, you're not that special. Because all these qualities that you think make you some, something, someone created in the image of God, don't count. You have the same DNA as a rat. You have the same this as the that. You know, Missing the whole point. Yes, we have all these other amazing capacities and qualities. That's not what distinguishes us as being made in the image of God. What, what distinguishes us clearly in Scripture, bearing the image of God, and don't miss this because this is so lost for so many folks, uh, uh, who are followers of Jesus. The whole point of being made in the image of God is this, a, a particular purpose in bearing his image, to rule in the manner of God. So that's what he's saying. Back up in, in verse 26 to 28. Let's make mankind in our image and our likeness um, to do the things that I do. And so all these capacities that we have just support that. They aren't that. The fact that you're creative, the fact that you have an imagination, all important things, but not the thing that, that says that's the image of God in you. Those are the things that represent God's creation of us so that we could bear his image, which is to do the things he does. You follow me on this? It might sound like I'm, you know, a very subtle thing or an in inconsequential thing. It's so important. Because we're the only creation, we're the only creatures given this commission. There's clever monkeys, there's clever fish, there's clever insects, there's clever, there's clever microorganisms. Uh, and if you listen to a guy named Dan Dennett, he's a scientist at Tufts, he'll say he's, a, he's an atheist and uh, loves to talk about the fact that, no, this microbe gets inside the brain of this insect and tells the insect to do this. And the insect does that, and then it affects humans this way. You're thinking, okay, you're trying to flatten it to say that none of us is all that special. No microbe was given the commissioning to rule over creation. No mammal was given that commission, etc. If we get this, everything, everything else that I say is going to make a lot of sense and become functional for us, operational. So if the first big idea is this, God blessed us with qualities and capacities, bingo, yes, for a particular purpose in bearing his image, which to bring order to the world as we move within it, faithfully serving God and his creation. That's what it means to bear the image of God. 
And everything I'll say, I say beyond that is going to be commentary on that. We're to bring order to the world as we move within it, faithfully serving God and His creation. We bring order into our own lives under the authority of God, the sovereignty of God. We bring order into our families under the authority and sovereignty of God. We bring order into the marketplace. We bring order into the laboratory. We bring order into, you know, right? We bring order everywhere. There are rules and regulations. There's practices and processes. There's, there's ways of doing things. And if there's a conflict, we have, a, we have order uh, in the judicial system to sort things out. And if you've created somebody and somebody says, I like what you've created, I think I'm going to make money on it, you say, no, I have a patent that represents the way we orderly track people's ownership and rights of things, right? So this is where we are. We're bringing order to the world as we move within it, uh, internal to us and external to us, faithfully serving God and His creation. The Psalms declaim this, you know, and they, the, the Psalms express this. My favorite version of this is Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is a, is a restatement of, of Genesis. And even in a fallen world, the psalmist can say, look what you've given us to do. It's amazing. I'll just read um, Psalm 8 for you, 1 through 9. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings, that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Whoa. Powerful. A powerful description of our purpose. That we bear the image of God. Now all aspects of creation are noteworthy and uh, amazing and awesome in their own way, right? You can sing the praises of all aspects of creation, but we dare not worship them. What we say is our purpose is to serve them as we serve the God who made us and whose image we bear. This, this is a right sizing and a right framing of what it means to be a human being. Now, sin cannot remove the image of God from us. Let that sink in. Sin does not remove the image of God from us. It redirects it. And instead of doing things that benefit all creation and honor and glorify God, we do things and have the capacity to do things that destroy it. Putin is made in the image of God and he's exercising it vigorously in the wrong direction. On your best, on your worst days, I should say, you do the same thing. You align all your capacities to do things that later you regret or you're ashamed of or you have to apologize for or pay a fine to get out of. This is the bane of being a human being. We bear the image of God. Uh, and and, and <laughs> uh, if you ever followed the whole punk music uh, movement, I, th I found it fascinating because I happened to be in London when punk was just coming on the scene and nothing like this existed in the United States at the time in California. And I'm walking around with my young cousins and I'm just, my jaw is hanging down when I'm looking. I go, did that hurt when you put the... The, the safety pin through your cheek like that, you know, um, and it's shocking. And one of the bands that came out at that time, uh, the, one of the early best bands besides the Sex Pistols, um, was The Clash. And this guy, Joe Strummer, um, who was a guitar, guitar player for The Clash, wrote this song. And in the song, he has this verse. And you might say, this is so obscure. Why are we going down this rabbit hole? Well, because it's, a, it's an encapsulation of living in a fallen world and yet still bearing the image of God. So bear with me. We're going deep theology diving here in the clash uh, <laughs> in 70s London. And he says, everybody wants to rule the world. Must be something we get from birth. Now, you, if, you, if you at all listen to music, when you hear that phrase, everybody wants to rule the world, you're thinking of Tears for Fears. Tears for Fears came out with that song and they became the beautiful version of punk 
you know, everybody loves Tears for, Fe- Tears for Fears. Moatic, you know, good looking guys, you know, normal looking guys in this band. They ripped it off from The Clash. And later, they, Joe Strummer confronted the guy who wrote it from Tears for Fears and said, You stole my song. You owe me five quid, and which means pay me five pounds and, and we're, we're even. But the original version, it was, it's a theological statement. Everybody wants to rule the world. Must be something we get from birth. Yes, it's endemic to us as human beings. And so people in the craziest manifestations are trying to uh, express that. So punk was an expression of that. When you see the things that people do, you might say, that's ridiculous, that's just so odd, Uh, you must not bear the image of God. It actually logically makes sense. Why? Because all behavior is meaningful. All behavior expresses something that's true within us, even if it's in the wrong direction. Why do girls des- you know, deny themselves food or cut their skin? These cute girls, I remember you know, girls in our your, the daughter's classes, cute girls starving themselves to death and cutting themselves. What's going on here? They're trying to rule their world. They're trying to make sense of a world that is overwhelming them. And we're trying to tell them to eat and not stop cutting themselves. And they're saying, I'm, I'm simply doing what, right? This is the enigma. You cannot escape bearing the image of God. You can only express it in ways that either glorify Him and bless Him or do the opposite. So that's why this is such an essential conversation for us. If we don't understand this, then we can't articulate this for people. Because we want to crush them when we see them doing things that we don't like. And yes, we should should confront them, but the way we should confront them is to say, do you know you're doing this because you bear the image of God? You're trying to rule and make sense of the or- and order your world in a way that is so destructive for you and for everybody around you. Can I help you understand the God that loves you and can realign you with His purposes so that as you bear His image, it blesses you and blesses people through you? You, you catch that conversation? Because if we just discount the, the evil and the craziness around us, we, we miss the fact that that means something. That means something. It means people who are disconnected from God are still trying to live out the fact that they bear His image to make order out of creation, only now it's disorder. Exodus tells us this, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath the waters, or in the waters below. Why? Because God has already made an image of Himself. It's you. You are made in the image of God. That's why we don't make images. Because they're less than what God made and called good. You. And the debate over is, are we born evil or good? The answer is yes. <laughs> we were created good, and immediately on birth, we inherit, we inherit sinful nature. And this is the key thing, whether Joe Strummer had any idea what he was talking about or not, he captured it. Must be something we get from birth. So that's the first point. God blessed us with qualities and capacities for a particular purpose of bearing His image. Which leads to the second point. And and, uh, it's this. Paul, the Apostle Paul, and now we're in the New Testament era, post Jesus' ministry and death and resurrection from the grave, post His ascension into heaven, His promise to return, His giving of the Holy Spirit. Now this fellow Paul has become a follower of Jesus. He's articulate, he's brilliant, he's an international man. He's a Roman citizen, he's a... um, uh, true blue Jew, he has all the credentials and qualifications to be an apostle of Jesus, which he is. And Paul tells us that Jesus is the image of God and his promised rescue of the world. He is the one to restore us into our right mind, our right heart, our right relationship with God, so that we can actually understand and express properly the image of God in us. This is what he says. Out of, he writes to the Colossians. This is a little, a little church up in uh, what modern, what's now modern-day Turkey. So Colossians 1, 15-20. Classic text. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Same language we see in Genesis 1. Only now it's God Himself in our presence saying, this is what it looks like. Uh, the writer of Hebrews uh, says, 
Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the full expression of who he is. And so Paul goes on to say, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Not the firstborn as in being born uh, and qualifying for the job, but the first example, the prototokos, He's the one that is our, he is the one that represents what this is supposed to be by being made in the image of God and fully functioning in it. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. All things. The hydrogen that fills the universe, all things. The nitrogen and carbon and oxygen that makes life possible, all things. Nothing left out. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. I love the fact that that throughout the New Testament there's these organic images, these relational images used to describe things that we think of as institutional. When you say the word church, people think, ah, an institution. A corrupt, perhaps, institution. A confused and confusing institution. An institution that tends to close in on itself uh, and uh, hides from the world. And when they try to reach the world, they oftentimes do it on their own terms in a way that people find off-putting. That church. But it's not an institution. It's a body. Uh, In another place, Paul calls it the bride of Jesus. The, The household of God. The family of God. The plant. The living temple. All those organic expressions to describe it. So he says of Jesus, Paul continues, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, to restore the proper understanding and application of the image of God in us. But Jesus, no, 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 you're confused, Steve. Jesus died so we can go to heaven. No, he did not die so we can go to heaven. He certainly didn't die so we could go to church. He died so that we could be alive in him and reconnected to the image of God in us. Therefore, what we do is we gather to worship him in places called church. We look forward to a new heaven and a new earth, yes. But the essential purpose of this is to be reconciled to God, to come back into our right heart, our right mind, and understand what it means to bear the image of God. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. So that's the second point. Jesus is the image of God and God's solution for rescuing and restoring the world. Final point is this. And we're going to spend a little bit more time on this point. Jesus shows us that ruling in his image is servant leadership. How do you operationalize and make functional this notion, this beautiful, massive, magnificent notion that we're made in the image of God? Uh, It's it's, it's reduced to a very simple term, uh, servant leadership. Not a program, but a person. Christ in you and you in Christ. So Jesus shows us that ruling in his image, ruling and subduing and ordering in his image is servant leadership. And we see this in, you see this throughout the gospel. I'm just picking the passage from Mark uh, uh, chapter 10. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, teacher, they said, Rabboni, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's a very humble, as they say in England, that's cheeky. So Jesus, was he smiling? Was he looking bemused? Was he going, what? Did he step back? But he asked them, well, what do you want me to do for you? In the bubble above his head, it would have said, it can't be good. It can't make sense. I don't even think you have any idea where this is going to go. But sure, yeah, what would you like me to do for you? Because it's really an open invitation to Jesus to talk about why he came. Sure, yeah, I'll start with wherever you are and I'll take it where it needs to go. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, well, (laughs) I knew it would work, you know. Well, let let one of us sit at your right and the other sit at your left in glory. Oh, you just want to sit at the right and left hand of God. 
Oh, why didn't you say so? Sure. Oh, yeah. That's easy. No. So he says, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're asking. You have no idea what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And immediately they, immediately they said, we can. We can. Now, years ago, I was studying at the University of Washington in this intensive linguistics program sponsored by Wycliffe Bible Translators and the University of Washington. And it was this 10-week intense linguistics program. Really awesome stuff. And brilliant professors, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the translators uh, who was there was a professional linguist and had been translating a, a, an unwritten language into written language, was talking about this passage. And, and she was saying... Um, well, when I, I'm working on this passage, and, I, and I, I've translated it into the language of the people, but you know, language is subtle, it has nuances, and so she said, uh, these people are now believing in Jesus, and they're growing in their faith, and they're loving getting the Bible in their own language, and so I get to this passage with them, I said, hey, let me, let me read this to you, this is what I, I think um, it sounds like in your language, and as she's reading it to them, they're both shocked and laughing. They're shocked, like, oh my gosh, and then they start laughing. And she said, what? What's going on? And she said, well, the people said, well, what's going on is you have James and John coming to Jesus, making this request, and Jesus says, Jesus says to them, well, can you outdrink me? And, and they said, yes, we can outdrink you. And so this is what was going on in this culture. And, he, and she's like, whoa, 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 let me pull this back. Let's just redo this. Said, no, that's not what he's saying at all, Right. But it may as well have been because James and John are so sure and convinced, oh, yes, of course. If that's all we have to do, yeah, fine. It's a mere detail. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Can you imagine how many times John later thought about this when he was exiled on the island of Patmos? a barren rock in the Mediterranean, thinking, what was I thinking about? Have you ever said anything that you wish you could unsay? You, can you remember your younger self saying things and now you think, I, I, can't imagine, well, I can't imagine what my parents were thinking and what my teachers or coaches or whoever else was hearing this was thinking, but I hate to think I now know what they were thinking because I can see it from the perspective of maturity. This is ridiculous. I wish I could take it back. And you're now embarrassed 40 or 50 years later. It's kind of like looking at pictures of what you wore. At certain points in your life, you thought, I can't believe I wore that. You know. Why did my mother let me? Oh, she didn't let me. I told her I was going to wear it no matter, you know. So here's the dilemma. Jesus says, no, no, you will. You will drink this cup. You will be baptized in his baptism. But then he, he lets them know what's going on. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. And of course, he's talking about this incredible theology of God lifting, raising him up and seating him at the right hand. Everybody wants to rule the world, must be something we get from birth. Now, the coda to this, the follow on to this, I find amusing. Maybe you do too. When the ten heard about this, they said, uh, they became indignant with James and John. What do you think they were indignant about? Could it have been, uh, why didn't I think of that? Why did they get to him first? I was going to ask that. Or how dare they be so presumptuous? But really it's not so much that. It's that, hey, no, that's a great idea. Is it too late to get in on that? Jesus had said, right, these are, this is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And when the ten heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, look, can we just talk? Can we just talk about the world you live in and what it looks like for people to bear the image of God in their own thinking? You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. How would you like to be in that program? Ah, you are in that program. The, the Romans are lording it over you. You know exactly what that feels like. You know what it feels like to have your own priests, Pharisees and Sadducees, lord it over you.
Their high officials exercise authority over them. Exercise is a very kind way of saying they abuse authority over them. So Jesus came up with things like, hey, if they make you carry their pack one mile, carry it two. Outdo them. What they want to do by way of abusing their, their authority under the color of a badge or a rank, you show them that what you do is motivated by love. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Can you imagine how quiet it was in that room? Like, whoa. I had no idea. It just seemed so right at the time. Well, it was right in a sense that you were, you were acting out of the fact that you're created in the image of God, to bear his image, to rule and subdue and bring order into the world. You have been socialized. First of all, your, your nature has been corrupted by sin. And then you've been socialized into a system that says, this is how you work it. This is how you play the game. This is how you get it done. This is how you game the system. And everybody in this room is to some degree or another an expert at that. As much as we hate to admit it. It's so unconscious to us, we don't even realize we, we, we do it. And it's not to feel ashamed that you have some level of expertise in that. It's just that you're doing what you were created to do. To bear the image of God is just not aligned with God's purposes. And therefore it doesn't really work according to God's purposes and doesn't achieve God's purposes. Therefore, John later writes, John when he writes his letters, he writes the Gospel of John, he writes some letters. In 1 John 2 he says, therefore whoever claims to live in Jesus must live as Jesus did. That was his takeaway from that whole conversation. Years later as it matured and percolated throughout his thinking and in his head and his heart he realized, okay, that's what this means. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. This is a great summary of servant leadership. We are served by Jesus to serve others, and we serve Jesus by serving others. Right? Let me say that again. We are served by Jesus to serve others. And by serving others, we serve Jesus. Why is this distinction important? This is not some kind of irrelevant nuance. This is a really important order of things. Again, recapturing what it means to live in the image of God. Here's what Paul told the Athenians. We see this in Acts 17. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Because he was standing at the Parthenon, the Acropolis, that hill above Athens, and they have all these monuments to various gods, and they have one to the unknown God, just to kind of make sure you don't miss anything. And now Paul is there saying, all these temples, God doesn't need this. He could have been standing in Jerusalem saying the same thing. It's, it's, that served its purpose, but its, its purpose has been fulfilled. He does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands. Now that's a, that's a different way of thinking, because we tend to think, I want to serve God. It's a beautiful thought, I want to serve God. As if God needs to be served. Paul says here, God does not need to be served. He's got plenty of servants. Seraphim, the cherubim. He does not need to be served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because that's what happens. It devolves into, oh, okay, I've got to do something for God. I've got to give God part of my income. <sighs> Again, I've got to make time to serve others. No, because God is going to be bummed out if I don't. God wants me to do this with my sexuality. God wants me to do this with my money. God wants me to do... Oh, it's never ending. When did it stop? This is where that goes. I've got to serve God. I've got to prop God up. I've got to praise Him so He doesn't feel insecure. I've got to make sure He knows that, no, you're number one to me. You're, I, you know, the whole horoscope thing, just a fun thing I do. But no, no, you're the one. And it goes on and on. It becomes ever more subtle and more nuanced in all the ways that we say... Oh, fine, I'll do this for God. I'll throw God a bone. You might not feel like you're doing that or feel like you have to do that. All of us do this. 
Because we're masters at rationalizing what I think it means to bear God's image. It means that I honor, glorify me. I make life comfortable for me. I don't like being around people who bum me out. Who does? Why would everything I just said is okay? Until you see where it ultimately goes. Rather, Paul says, God Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So when we say we're serving God, what we're really doing is we're we're recognizing that God is serving us in Christ through His Holy Spirit, so that we can serve others. So in that sense, you can say, well, then I am serving God because I'm, you know, I'm in this relationship with a God who's serving me, and on behalf of that God, I'm serving others, so I'm really serving God. Yeah, it's fine. That's why I say we are served by Jesus to serve others, and we serve Jesus by serving others. Whatever you do for the least of these, remember when Jesus said that in Matthew 25? You did it for me. Remember when he says, hey, you, uh, you guys on the right side, the sheep side versus the goat side, Sorting people out. You know, thank you for visiting me in prison. Thank you for feeding me when I was hungry. Thank you for clothing me when I was naked. Well, we didn't even see you in those conditions. What do you mean? No, you're giving us credit we don't deserve. Ah, whenever you did it for the least of these, you're doing it for me. I had no idea. So that's what this is about. So let's just wrap it up. I take the next few minutes to talk about what is servant leadership? It's such a bandied about term. It was first made a, a business term uh, 40 or f- almost 50 years ago by Robert Greenleaf. It's a business uh, certainty, servant leadership. It's something everybody in business knows and nobody in business does. Because servant leadership is one of those high-sounding, wonderful things. Uh, And it's so good. But what is it? And So let me give you my take on it. I've read a zillion things on servant leadership, uh, and here's my take on it. Servant leadership is helping others succeed by providing what they need. You're the boss, you say to the person who's subordinate to you, who you supervise, who you're responsible for, you say, what do you need to do your job? You might might even personalize it. You might say to them, "Uh, what's one thing you'd like me to start doing? What's one thing you'd like me to stop doing? What's one thing you'd like me to keep doing as your boss? Wow. All of it, though, for the point of saying, what do you need to succeed? What do you need to thrive? A phenomenal leader is one who simply asks these kinds of questions. Hey, what do you need? That's a mess. What do you need to get that right? We agreed on this. It doesn't seem to be that. What happened? What can I do to help you get it right? Right? And so these are the conversations that servant leaders um, initiate and allow. A servant leader allows somebody to come in their presence and, and say, hey, this isn't working because we talked about this, but the system isn't aligned to do that. Manufacturing isn't talking to marketing, and marketing is complaining about or whatever. Servant leadership looks like this. Yeah, but I keep doing stuff and they keep taking advantage of me. Oh, that's not servant leadership. That's a lack of boundaries. You're allowing people to take advantage of you. Servant leadership is simply helping others succeed by providing what they need, by asking questions. So you ask yourself, what can I do to help them thrive, to help them flourish, help them grow in their capacity to serve others? It's not I'm doing their job for them. How can I help you do what you need to do? Mom, would you do my homework for me? Uh, Certainly not. First of all, I have no idea what that math is. But most importantly, because it's your job to do that. I will help you do whatever it takes to help you, help you, help you do that. And then what's the point of it all? Well, servant leadership is about fulfilling our calling and helping people fulfill their calling as people made in God's image. I'm supposed to walk around ruling over creation by saying, what do you need here? How can I help you overcome that barrier? How can I help you identify the resources you need? How do I I connect you to people who might be able to help you? Servant leadership is powerful that way. It's not about being humiliated. It's about being humble. And so look at the spheres of influence in your life. Who are you connected to in any way that your behavior, good or bad behavior, has an influence on them? You can really bum them out by what you say or do, or you can bless them by what you say or do. Start there. What are the spheres of influence? Those connect points. You might have one or two. You might have 50. I don't know. But start there and say, well, um, 
what if I asked these people what I could do? Find the right language. What could I do to help you? What could I do to serve you? What could I do to assist you? Find the right language. You see, how can I serve you? That might be just odd. You know, clean up my room. You know, well. How about questions like this? What did Jesus do that I could do? Why did Jesus do what he did? How did he do it? He did different things in different ways all the time. So what's the, any pattern? Or do you see something going on there that you could emulate? Remember, not every need is your call. Not every need is your call. You might walk by a hundred needs on the way to the one that you're supposed to deal with. Jesus did. Not every need is your call. Not everybody's problem is yours to solve. Uh, in the backcountry ranger station above Tuolumne Meadows in the High Sierra, in the winter ranger's cabin, there's a sign that says, poor planning on your part does not require an emergency on mine. Or something to that effect. I can't remember the exact word of it. But basically, saying, don't run in here and tell me because you didn't pack properly or bring the right equipment, I'm supposed to save you. I'll direct you to the road that'll get you back so you can hike, hitchhike back down to <laughs> Lee Vining or something. Not every need is your call, but which needs are? What is your calling in this season of life? Well, I'm only 15. Okay, what's your calling? You have a calling, something you're supposed to be serving in order to bless the world. You're 15. What does it look like? Uh, doing my homework? Ah, yeah, good guess. Not making life miserable for my parents? Mm hmm. Maybe letting my parents know that I'm feeling lonely and frustrated or put upon? Yeah, that counts too. Being honest and forthright with your mom and dad. Maybe thanking them once in a while. Maybe realizing that they do a lot of stuff that they don't want to do necessarily, but it's to help you. All of a sudden, you're 15 and now you're empowered to ask questions, to have a conversation. Maybe you're 50. Maybe you're going, I am, everybody's depending on me. I have no bandwidth. Don't even ask me. Oh, no, no. Let's stop and pause for a second. What does it look like in your season of life? Hey, maybe in your season of life, you're supposed to be saying no to things. You've let, you've let everybody get so attached and dependent on you. You kind of like it, but you resent it. How about now you start unloading those and say, hey, let's have a talk. I've done everything I can to get you here, help you get here, and I can't do anything else. So I'm going to cheer you on. I'm going to pray for you. I'll consult with you. But I've done everything I can do. What season are you in? I've never, known, I've never had this much time and money. I don't know what to do with it. We can help with that. Maybe, maybe find somebody who can help you be smart about what you do with that time and money you never thought you'd have. This is all about your calling, right? Calling is the word vocation. Vocare means calling. You have a calling. This is what the commissioning of being a person bearing the image of God and ruling the world is about. Fulfilling your vocation, your calling. Some vocations you get paid for, like a job. Other vocations are just things you do to, to impact the world. Your primary vocation is walking with God as His beloved. And your primary vocation supports all your other vocations. If you're having a bad day doing the servant leadership thing, just pause and say, Lord, am I abandoning and not paying attention to my primary thing, and that is being in a relationship with you? I need to restore that and reconnect that. I love the way Frederick, Be Frederick Beekner, B-U-E-C-H-N-E-R, uh, I've loved this guy's writing for like 40 years. Frederick Beekner, he's probably 99 years old now, I don't know, 96 or something like that. He's a brilliant writer, East Coast guy. He describes vocation this way, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Your ultimate calling is the place where your deep gladness, the thing that makes you feel most alive, meets a significant and deep need in the world. That could be in so many scenarios. Don't get, be too quick to, I've got to be Mother Teresa and go to the, the dead and dying. You know, No, it's where are you and where can you serve in a way that just you feel alive doing that. You love making things. And you love blessing people by helping them fix things or whatever. And their deep need is to get things fixed. This is the neat thing about vocation. It's very dynamic. And see, by investing yourself, you become the most alive, fulfilled, and joyful version of you. Now, if this is true, why don't we pursue this? If this is another way of saying you're lined up with the image of God in you, if this is true and we never feel better than when we're doing that, why don't we pursue this? Why don't we consciously, intentionally think about this? Why, why, why? 
And the short answer is that we don't believe we bear the image of God. We believe it's just an honorific, a, a nice thing that we see in the Bible and not a functional, essential core thing without which life does not make sense. I'll rephrase that. If we don't know who we are in Christ, we won't know who we are in the world. If we don't know who we are before God, we will not know who we are before people. And we'll be asking people, tell me who I am. To what should I do? You see the linkage there? If we're not focusing on what it means to bear the image of God, to learn how to say yes and no, I will, I won't. You can count on me. I'm not available. Whatever the right answer is. If we don't get that right, because we're walking with God as our primary vocation, learning how to understand what it means to bear His image, if we don't know who He is, we will not know who I am, and I won't know who you are, right? To bear something means carrying the weight of it. If I'm bearing the image of God, I'm carrying the weight of it, the grandeur, the honor, the glory, whatever it is, the responsibility of it. To bear something means supporting it. To, to bear something means applying your strength to it. I'm going to lift that up. I'm going to carry that. You see, we might acknowledge the image of God in us, but we don't intentionally mobilize our life around it. And it doesn't take all that much effort. It just, makes, it just takes a bit of intentionality. How about if I just keep doing what I currently do, but see it as a way of bearing the image of God? Would I make any tweaks in it? Would that lead me to maybe make a big wholesale shift? I don't know. If we don't do it, we become distrustful, lonely, empty, preoccupied with ourselves, and preoccupied with our problems. Because a small God means big problems. Big, big problems mean a small God. A big God means small problem. Or smaller than we thought, right? Without him, without this, we have a lack of empathy. We just don't give a rip. It's not my problem. We have a strong desire to conserve our energy and to conserve our resources. I don't know if I have enough. I can't really help you. You should have thought of that. And this is a functional description of what it's like being in hell. Being in hell is a lack of empathy. It's I don't give a rip. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Take care of it yourself. I'm distrustful, I'm lonely, I'm empty, I'm preoccupied with myself. You think you got it bad, I got it worse. That's a description of hell. C.S. Lewis made this observation. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it, he says. Everybody in hell chooses it. I don't believe in a God who would send me to hell. You don't have to. I wouldn't believe that about God either. You're choosing to go there. You're choosing. Why would you do that? You bear the image of God. Milton had a brilliant poem, Paradise Lost. And in it he has Satan saying, I'd rather be the king of hell than a servant in heaven. That's how it goes. So when we make room in our lives for others and care for others in Jesus' name, we are embracing our calling and therefore embracing Him and therefore living out what it means to bear the image of God. With appropriate boundaries, with rest and refreshment, all that. Uh, I'll finish by saying this. COVID disrupted this. But unhealthy individualism has been at play in our culture for a very long time. COVID exacerbated what is already true about our culture. They have, I don't know if they still have it at Nordstrom's. They used to have a theological section in the women's um, clothing area. It was called the Individualist. I don't know if you ever remember that section. In order, I, when, I, when I was, I wouldn't say dragged in there, but when I accompanied my daughters or my wife, and I'd walk in there, I'd see the, I think it's called the individualist, something like that, and I would always add, it's the rugged individualist. You know, and I would think, oh, now that's such an American thing. I, this is the individualist section. They could have just called the whole store the individualist, and it would have been perfect. Individualism is a really critically important thing. Every teenager needs to go from being dependent on mom and dad to being an individual. However, Americans take it to the whole next level of being an individual. And what's happening in our culture is everybody is too caught up in being an individual. 
80% of churches in America are shrinking. I know, bitter snacks, that's what we need. No. The divorce rate is stabilized at 50% only because, in my opinion, less people are getting married. <laughs> Most couples I know live together. They don't get married. Why would I get married? It's too complicated. So the, the people who are crazy enough to get married, they stabilize at a 50% divorce rate. And we, all, we think that's really great. Well, it just says that we're individuals. We're afraid of making the commitment. I want to rule the world on my terms. I've been like this since birth. And this is not a matter of introversion or extroversion. It's about doing life together. What does it mean to be in community? Uh, Bonhoeffer said we need time alone, we need time together. We pretty much want to have time alone or with people on our terms in small doses. I'll wrap it up by saying this. We said the Lord's Prayer today. Thank you very much. That beautiful prayer and the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is praying together. Notice the language in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us, lead us, deliver us. Give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us, us, not just me. Now if I'm my own, and I, I pray the Lord's Prayer on my own, but I'm praying on behalf of the community. And I'm, and I'm praying it for myself. Lord, forgive me my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. But forgive me more. You know, we, have, we, we need to say it on our own. But it's always a communal prayer. And they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. He said, pray as a community. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus calls us out of isolation into community, into a community, a unique community, shaped by His image. And so we pray it as a commitment and lean into it as a community. Why? Because it leads us to Christ. In whose image we're saved to serve together, caring for the world that He created. So Lord Jesus, that's my prayer for me, uh, for my brothers and sisters here, for this church, for the people beyond the walls of this place who uh, know you but aren't connected anywhere, uh, who don't know you and are disconnected uh, from their rightful identity as those who bear the image of God. So Lord, I pray that you do a work of renewal in us. You do a work of revival in this church, a work of regeneration, a work of restoration, that, that in this church and in every church in this community, that would be the movement of your spirit to restore your people to the rightful identity as those who bear the image of God. I pray that this movement of renewal and awakening would sweep our city and our county and our state and our country and join those movements already underway around your world, that your will would be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' high and holy name. Amen. We're going to wrap up worship. We're going to sing a song to worship God. Uh, this is a chance to you present yourself to him. You say, Lord, I've been listening to the music, to the prayers, to the message. What do you want to say to me? If you want to contribute anything, you can contribute on the way out or mail it to us or whatever. But we, we exist because of the goodwill of God's people. Um, you exist because of God's goodwill in you as you learn how to bear his image wherever he leads you. Let's continue and wrap up worshiping the Lord together. Yeah. 
What a perfect beginning for the rest of your day. As you leave today, if, you, if we can pray for you, go right around the corner into the prayer garden. There'll be some people who have a brief prayer with you for anything that concerns you or anything that you're concerned about. Uh, get a, a snack, uh, something to eat outside, or we have a light brunch. And then at 11, um, about, about 11, you're going to hear some music. Come in here, and we're going to do two short videos and a little bit of discussion called Conversations. Um, I think these are the two best videos we've shown all year. They're fantastic because they capture what we're talking about right now. So uh, let us pray for you. Get some deep. Come back for a conversation. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.